The first reading today is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 31. And it begins on page 1 of the Old Testament in your pew Bible if you would like to follow along. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. The New Testament readings will begin with Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, and it can be found on page 189 of the New Testament in your pew Bibles. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The second reading comes from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 48. It can be found on page 129 of the New Testament in your pew Bible. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On Tuesday, most of us, hopefully all of us, went to the polls. And we voted. And we elected a new president. On Wednesday, we heard of protests and demonstrations. 
The reality is, regardless of who won this election, we live in a country divided. Some are doing the happy dance, and some are terrified. I don't think I've ever seen it as clear in terms of for and against as I have in this election. So where do we go from here? What do we have to do? You know, I like to take credit and think that this sermon title was something I I thought up all on my own, but it's not. About, golly, 38, 40 years ago, I read a book that was written by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And the title was, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And by the way, just to let you know, had the election results come out the other way, this still was the sermon title. I picked this out weeks ago because I knew we would be a nation divided. Dr. King wrote this book in the aftermath of the Voting Rights Act. Something that took place in 1964, I think it was, when finally everyone was going to be offered that right to vote without any kind of obstructions. It was a day that the civil rights movement championed and thought, this is wonderful. But a year later, they looked at it and began to wonder how wonderful it was. Because there were still riots, there were still black people being persecuted and tortured, it's just the the battle lines had shifted. It was no longer in the South, but it had now moved north, in the cities of the northern parts of this country. In writing, Dr. King reflected Maybe what has happened is that the northern white population watched in horror at all the atrocities being carried out against black people and thought, this has got to stop. So they supported the legislation. He said, but then when it came to treating their their black sisters and brothers as equals, They struggled because they weren't ready to do that. Folks, that was a nation divided. Today, we're a nation divided. So how do we deal with this? I I think that we as the church, the body of Christ, are in a very powerful position to set the tone and the example for what our nation must do. But in order to do that, we have to begin by looking at where we are and seeing if we're willing to pay the price to make the sacrifice. You see, the first message we have to proclaim is that we are one. Paul said to the church at Galatia that was being torn apart, in Christ Jesus, There's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. We are all one. But we're not one in the church today. You know, we we have our different views. We have our different perspectives. And we've talked about these in the past. Some people believe you need to be baptized by immersion, others by sprinkling or pouring. As United Methodists, we believe all three are accurate. Some people believe that if you're going to be baptized by immersion, you must dunk the person backwards. Others believe you must dunk the person forwards. Some believe that you must dunk the person backwards in flowing water. Some believe you must dunk the person forward in flowing water. In other words, it can't be a still pond. Some people believe that when you dunk the person backwards in flowing water, the water needs to be flowing from north to south. Others believe it needs to be flowing from east to west. 
That's on one item that we are divided. And yes, there are those people that would say, well, if they weren't dunked in flowing water by dunking them backwards and the water was flowing north to south, their baptism doesn't count. They're not really a Christian. Do you see the problem we have? We are divided over so many issues. And the reason why is we are not keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. Instead, we are keeping our eyes focused on our doctrines and our beliefs. In order for the church to model what this country needs to do, we need to begin by saying we are all sisters and brothers in Christ. The second thing we have to do is we have to see the world through the eyes of the other. You look at all the divisions in our country, and they're all the result of seeing the world through my perspective. African Americans become afraid after they hear of people being shot, so they start a movement. Black Lives Matter. Police officers become afraid in their families because they hear of Black Lives Matter and they think their lives are on the line, so we start a movement. Blue Lives Matter. Then other people say, well, one second, what about our group? White Lives Matter. And we begin to have these groups because we're thinking inside about me. Do, never have we stopped as a nation to collectively say, why are African Americans afraid of the police? These are troubling times right now, and a lot of it's because of the rhetoric. I have a friend who has a friend who's African American. And this African American posted on Facebook after the election that she was scared. Do you know what response she got from some person that she really didn't even know? The response was, you and your people need to go back to Africa where you belong, because this is white America now. It wasn't Mr. Trump that wrote that post, but it was the rhetoric that empowered people to think, this is where we are. There are people protesting in the streets because they are genuinely scared. And we can't just dismiss that. How many of you have ever been scared in your life? Ever been scared? No one? Some of you have never been scared before? My golly! You've missed out on it. I've been scared. I remember a time when... I was with my sister and brothers, my sisters and brother. We had hiked to one of those rocks, I, I think it was Black Rock. It was along the Appalachian Trail at South Mountain overlooking the Hagerstown Valley. Now, I'm afraid of heights, okay? I, I, I make no bones about that. So we get up to this place, and it was a beautiful sight, and I'm sort of, there's the edge, I'm back here looking at it. My brother's not afraid of heights, so he's out there jumping around right at the edge, looking over, oh my golly, jumping from side to side. Guess what I'm doing? I'm sitting on one of the rocks as far away as I can, and I'm sobbing. I'm terrified. My brother is going to fall to his death today. My sisters come up, Bobby, don't be afraid, he's fine, he knows what he's doing. Do you think that made me feel better and say, oh, okay, I'm good now? Why? because I was scared. And no matter what I was told, I wasn't going to feel safe until my brother came off the edge and we all were able to walk back on the trail where you couldn't see the edge. If people are scared, they are scared. And we can't shrug it off by saying, oh, they don't have anything to be afraid of. To be quite honest, if I were African-American and I had received that post, I would be terrified right now. Scared wouldn't begin to describe it. There are students in our colleges and universities who were brought to this country illegally by their parents 
before they could even remember what their homeland looked like. Those students on college campuses today who are illegal immigrants are terrified that they're going to be sent back home to a nation they don't even know and to people they really don't know. We have to recognize the fear in the same way that we have to recognize the fear of those people who are related to police officers who whenever they hear about protests begin to think, oh my golly, is this going to be it? Is my loved one going to die? We need to look at the world through the eyes of the other. And not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the Christian thing to do. Why do you think Jesus was so popular among the outsiders of his day? He was willing to see the world through their eyes. It didn't mean he always agreed with them, but he understood their fears. Tax collectors like Jesus. Not because he was going to give them a break, but because he heard. Prostitutes like Jesus. Not because he was just going to say, okay, go and do what you want, but because he heard and he understood their struggles. You see, that's what we're called to do. We can't live in our own little shells, in our own little cocoons, and think everything's safe because it's safe for me. If there is one person in this world, in this country, that's afraid today, we should all claim it as our responsibility to do everything we can to take away the fear. Because that's what we do as followers of Jesus. I have a safety pin on today. It's not on there because I forgot to take it off. It's not on there because this suit went to the cleaner and I took the tag off but forgot about the pin. It's there because I learned the other day that this is a sign to someone who's scared that I'm a safe person to talk to. I firmly believe everyone who follows Jesus should be wearing a safety pin. That's my perspective. That's my understanding. You've got to come to your own terms of where you think you are. I had someone at the 815 service that I said that to. She had a pin on holding her scarf together, but it was underneath of her sweater. She came out after church, and the pin was up here, and she said, I didn't know about that until now. This is where I'm wearing my pin now. Because she wanted people to know she was safe. Ed Dance has a group that meets in this building called AA, and he has two of them actually, on Thursday and on Saturday. How many people do you think would come to that AA meeting if they were told, well, you know, we got someone there writing down your name and what you've done, and we're going to go back and report it to your family and to your boss? How many people do you think would show up? Not a one. Why? Because it wasn't safe. We gather in a sanctuary to worship. And sanctuaries are to be safe places. We need to make sure that we are safe for all God's children. Whether those peace people are straight or gay, whether they're part of the LGBTQ community, whether they're African American, whether they're Mexican, we need to make sure they know they're safe, whether they're police officers or not. They are safe in here, and we're willing to hear them. There's one other thing we need to do as a community of faith. We need to be willing to take a stand and speak truth to power. That's true whether the president is a Republican or a Democrat, that's true whether our congressional leaders are Republicans and Democrats. i got to tell you, that's not easy for me to do. I'm not one of those people who stands up, you might find that hard to believe, but who stands up and takes stands. I'm not a protester. But I realize that we need to name the sin when we see it. 
And when I talk about sin, I'm not just talking about saying words we're not supposed to say. I'm talking about making posts that terrify others on Facebook. I'm talking about using language that causes people to be afraid. We need to name it, because it sure isn't of God, is it? Folks, this country will survive. And we may become better. We don't know. President Trump in four years may be the most popular president we've ever seen. But that's not the issue. The issue is, are we willing to do what we need to do to make sure that people know we're safe and to make sure people know that they can talk to us and to do everything we can do to make sure that people don't need to be afraid. It's who we're called to be. It's what we're called to do. Amen.